Today we're going to go back in time and we're going to make a white wine from grapes. I'm on the little backyard vineyard and the Traminette's looking ready to be picked. Um, pH is about 3.1, sugar's about 22%. Um, we measured that with a refractometer, which you can just do a little drop of juice. But what I did was I took a sampling of about 40 or 50 berries and that should hopefully give us a pretty good idea. Skins look nice and kind of tender. And I think, I mean, I could, I could push this up to about a pH of 3.2, but if I wait much longer, um, I think we're gonna have some wasp problems here. So we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna pick those. I've got some little cheap little hand pruners that I'm gonna use. I'll put a link to these in the video description and just a bin. It's a really good morning to pick because it's nice and cold out. It's only about 50 degrees Fahrenheit today. So that's like really good for picking white grapes because I wanna make sure to not over extract these things, especially when I take them to the crusher and into the press. So make sure you've got your crusher kind of ready to go and your press kind of ready to go. And if you can't, take them straight there. Make sure you have a way to kind of keep them chilled on the way there. So we're gonna go ahead and we'll start picking. I've got the grapes inside and we're just gonna run it through the crusher destemmer, but I actually took the grate off of the bottom of the crusher destemmer, so we're really just gonna crush these grapes. We're gonna leave the stems, which make it a little bit easier to press. And then I'm adding about 1.2 grams of potassium metabisulfite dissolved in water. And that's gonna give me about 60 parts per million free SO2 if I assume that I'm gonna have um, about three gallons of of finished or of uh, juice here. So that'll be good. Um, I think, I mean, these white grapes are so vulnerable to oxidation. We just wanna make sure this really high air contact moment for them, they uh, get through it okay. So we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna pour these into the crusher here. You can see some of these grapes are white, white, and some of these are more like pink. The pink grapes are the Traminette that we picked, and then I had four vines of a mystery white grape <laughs> that was supposed to be Merlot, but obviously not. You can see the things that come in on grapes like this. There's a spider. So this is why, you know, as opposed to beer or something, you're not working with a sanitary situation. That's why things like the sulfites and pH management are really important with wine because there's obviously some bacteria, there's wild yeast that we're dealing with on these grapes. I'm just doing kind of a field blend just based on the amount that I have here. You could also crush these grapes by hand. You could literally stomp them if you wanted to. And since we're not removing the stems, it's, it's a whole lot easier than if you're doing a, a red wine and you're also destemming. Every white wine is a little bit different. This being a Traminette, we really don't want almost any skin contact time whatsoever. So immediately after crushing, I moved over and poured that slurry into the wine press. Whatever kind of white wine you're making, just do a little Googling and see if it's recommended to, you know, let it sit on the skins for an hour, as little as possible, two hours. Each wine is a little bit different. As far as pressing goes, it's really not going to be any different than pressing a red wine. It's a little bit harder to squeeze all the juice out because the berries aren't quite as broke down. So you may find that you want to break up the, the cake or the pumice when you're done pressing and basically repress it again 
You can do things like add rice hulls to the skins to try to make more little channels for that juice to go through. But otherwise, just crank in the basket press like any other grape. We got just under three gallons here, which is a little bit less than I was hoping to get, but for the first harvest on the little super tiny vineyard, it's not too bad. I'll probably get somewhere around double that next year. You can see it's really cloudy. That's completely normal. What we're gonna do now is we're gonna cold settle it. So I'm gonna put it in the fridge because I have a fridge down here, but if you don't have a fridge, you can fill a bin, like the bin you picked your grapes in um, with ice water and put the carboy in there for, I'd say about 24 hours, but you could go a little bit longer if you want. And we're just gonna let all this kind of chunky stuff settle to the bottom. Setting it down really gently. I've left our little micro batch of white wine um, to cold settle in the fridge for 48 hours. Um, you can get away with about 24 hours. Or you could go three days if you want, but at some point, there's really just not a lot more settling out of there. So what we're gonna do is rack it off of these leaves that are on the bottom of our carboy. And I'm gonna rack it into a three gallon carboy since that's gonna be a more appropriate size for this batch. And um, I'm gonna use about one and a half-ish teaspoons of pectic enzyme in this little carboy. And what that's gonna do is aid in clarifying this wine when it's all said and done. Normally you use enzymes to get better extraction from the fruit, but in the case of a white wine, intentionally I don't wanna use any enzymes until uh, it's completely off the skins because I don't want to extract from the seeds. I don't want to extract too much from the skins, at least on this wine, being that it's got a little bit of traminette or a good bit of traminette in it. Like I said earlier, look into the wine that you're making because some white wines, it is okay to do a small skin contact time. You might do as long as, you know, six to 12 hours on some white wines. But some white wines, like Traminet in particular, just don't do well with a long skin time like that. I ran another set of numbers on this wine now that it's kind of been sitting and it's all well mixed together. And my pH is about 3.16, which is a really, really good place to be for a crisp white wine, which is what I'm trying to make here. Something kind of like a Riesling type wine. Um, my, I've got about 20% sugar, which would make about um, just under 11% alcohol. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add a, just a tiny bit of sugar. I'm probably gonna push that up to about 21, somewhere between 21 and 22% sugar. And to do that, you can add an ounce and a half of just table sugar per gallon per percent sugar that you're trying to raise the, the wine or the must here. So sometimes I would make a simple syrup I'm just gonna put granulated sugar in and mix it up really good because it's gonna dissolve, the yeast is gonna help dissolve it. I'm gonna help stir it. Um, the reason I would use simple syrup is for something like back sweetening where I wanna invert that sugar before adding it, which would give me a better idea of how it's gonna taste in that wine because it's gonna invert itself over time with the high acid of the wine. So we'll go ahead, we'll add this pectic enzyme and pectic enzyme is a lot more effective at warmer temperatures and little to no alcohol present in the wine. So that's why I add this before we add the yeast. What I'll do now is 
bring it up to temperature. I'll put a little seed heater on it so it doesn't take forever to bring it up to temperature. And in the meantime, I'm gonna make a really nice yeast starter. Basically, I'll hydrate my yeast. Um, I'll probably use some go firm. And then I will uh, slowly add some of this, it's technically just juice now, to that yeast starter until I'll probably about quadruple the volume over the span of about an hour and just really get that yeast acclimated to this juice before we add it. And that's especially important with these white wines because they've got relatively high acid by comparison to a red wine. The yeast that I'm gonna use is Renaissance Fresco. It's relatively hard to find, but it's a super, super awesome yeast. It's incapable of producing hydrogen sulfide which is also really important when you're working with a relatively high acid wine and you're gonna to try to push the fermentation temperatures nice and cool to try to retain a lot of those aromas. Um, Fresco in particular is, um, it's actually technically marketed as a cider yeast, but I find it to be super awesome for white wines. And when you think about an apple cider and like a crisp white wine, there's not a major, difference there. Um, acids are going to be similar. The way you want it to present itself is going to be relatively similar. So I've just found that to be like by far my favorite yeast for white wine. There's one place that sells it in like 10 gram packets. Otherwise you have to work with a salesman, which is a giant pain. So I can't remember the name of it, but I'll put a note on the screen and you can go there and buy it but we'll go ahead and we'll you know start to warm this up and probably in an hour or so I'll get a yeast starter going and we'll get this fermentation kicked off and then what I'll do immediately after is I'll, I'll warm it up to about high 60s Fahrenheit to kick off the fermentation I want to make sure that yeast starts but then I'm gonna try to cool it back down to about like 55 Fahrenheit and I'm gonna ferment at a nice cool temperature like that to, like I said just trap those aromas and I'll churn it up once a day um, maybe even twice a day just to kind of keep that yeast happy and if you weren't using a non hydrogen sulfide producing yeast I would recommend sniffing it once a day and if and even giving it a little air once a day um, just to kind of keep the yeast happy and if you catch a sniff of hydrogen sulfide the rotten egg smell make sure you feed the yeast um, and in that case it's going to be it's probably a little air starved so you can give it a little bit of air too My juice temperature is up to about 68 degrees after a few hours with the uh, seed heating mat on it right now. And that's a pretty good temperature to start my white wine making yeast. If I were to do a red wine, I'd push a little bit higher, but I just don't want my white wine to ever get that hot. And I've got this just wonderful little yeast starter with, it's just foaming. It's huge huge cell count going on in this yeast right now so we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna pour that in um, the temperature of the yeast starter is about 78 degrees so it's within about 10 degrees which is kind of what you want you don't want to stunt uh, your your yeast when you pour it into your your juice like this I will say one word of caution, if you're using a stir plate like I did to really pump up this little yeast starter, just be careful you don't drop the uh, magnetic stir bar into the wine. I scoop that out with a spoon before I pour this in. We're gonna pour it in. And what, I mean, for how vigorous this uh, starter is, what I'll do is I'll actually turn the uh, the seed heater off. My basement's probably about 65. I have 100% confidence this is going to start with how, like I said, how foamy and aggressive that yeast starter is. So we'll check in on it tomorrow. And um, if everything's going well, what we'll do is we'll start to cool it down a little bit more and let it ferment nice and cool.
fermentation on a white wine at a cold temperature like this can take quite a while. It's pretty common to take upwards of three weeks, four weeks, even up to about six weeks. So you have to be a little bit patient with a wine like this. Once you think the fermentation's over, you see it stop bubbling, you can go ahead and let it settle out for a couple days. If you're using one of these H2S hydrogen sulfide free yeasts like the Renaissance Fresco that I'm using, you can let it settle for quite a while. I'll let it settle for a week easily and not get too worried about it. Once you see the, the yeast settle to the bottom, you can go ahead and rack off the yeast. At this point, you're really gonna wanna prevent malolactic fermentation. Unless you're making a wine like a Chardonnay or something where you really want that buttery wine. But in the case of a wine like this, a crisp, refreshing white wine, I really want to prevent malolactic fermentation. And the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to give it a nice dose of sulfur dioxide or sulfites in the form of potassium metabisulfite. So I'm going to give it about, if you were to look at a chart, um, you can see how much sulfite for your pH to microbially protect that wine. Well, I'm gonna give it about double that at this point. Those sulfites are gonna bind up, they're gonna oxidize, so it's not a big deal. You can give it double and over time it'll work back down and you just won't have to give it a boost later. So in my case, I'm gonna give it about um, 50 parts per million, maybe bump it up to about 60 parts per million of SO2 again and this doesn't mean we now have 120 because we added 60 in the mint in the beginning. That first 60 is long gone. Um, like I said, sulfites rapidly oxidize, they rapidly bind up. And if you were to measure them, usually they're much lower than that initial number that you added, if not zero over time, especially after a fermentation. Now some yeasts will create a little bit of sulfite. So like your EC1118, that'll produce a good bit of sulfite. So in the case of a wine like that, you might need to add a little bit less. To add my sulfites, I'm just gonna dissolve in water again and add to the carboy that I'm racking into. I'm not too worried about adding water to a white wine like I am to a red wine. If I was adding sulfites to a red wine, I always pull a sample of the wine, mix the sulfites and add. With white wine, water is, you're not really gonna water the wine down unless you add a lot. So I don't mind adding just a tiny, tiny bit of water every once in a while. So we'll go ahead and we'll rack this wine into an appropriately sized carboy. Once it's racked, you can see I've got a little bit of head space. So I'm gonna use this old Riesling from about a year ago, and I'm gonna use that to top up to the neck. You wanna use a similar wine. A Traminette and a Riesling are really similar. The parents of Traminette are Gewürztraminer and um, a hybrid that it's not a popular wine grape. And now all you're really doing is waiting for this wine to clear up. You want it to be crystal clear before you bottle it. And one other thing you're gonna wanna do is you're gonna wanna cold stabilize it. So I mentioned early on we cold settled. Well, now you wanna cold stabilize. And what that's gonna do is prevent any crystals in the bottle. So potassium bitartrate can fall out of stabilize or basically destabilize and fall out of the wine. By chilling the wine, you're gonna make sure this happens in the carboy and doesn't happen in the bottle. There's one other so you've got your cold settling, you got your cold stabilization. There's another thing called cold crashing, which I didn't mention in this video, but you could stall that fermentation by chilling it, and then that could be how you get your residual sugar if you do want a sweet wine. This particular wine, I'm gonna leave it dry. Once your wine is crystal clear, you can bottle it, but you can also consider back sweetening the wine. So swing by my video on how to back sweeten a wine if this is an approach you wanna take. You're gonna basically want to make sure all the yeast is off that wine. It's crystal clear and you're gonna to wanna to use potassium sorbate to make sure that a re-fermentation doesn't kick off. So that's pretty much it for making a white wine from grapes. I'll throw a little couple pointers at you, um, some things to watch for. 
You want to sniff that wine every single day. Your nose is going to be your best detector of if something is veering off course. And what you're looking for is that reductive character, which is hydrogen sulfide. So if you smell that little slightest, slightest bit of rotten egg smell in the wine when it's fermenting, this is an indication that the yeast is stressed, which means it probably needs a little bit of nitrogen, probably needs a little bit of air, or you could be pushing the temperature a little bit harder than that yeast can handle. So you might want to warm it up a few degrees. These non-hydrogen sulfide yeasts are a lifesaver. They're a game changer for making white wine. And I would 100% do anything you can to get your hands on them because it'll make your life so much easier as a white winemaker. Another thing, you always want to leave a little bit of headspace in your carboy when you're fermenting because things can bubble up, things can get a little vigorous in there. And if you're adding things to the wine, like say you're adding yeast nutrient, it's always best to dissolve that in some wine or some water before adding and add slowly because you just never know what's gonna happen. Sometimes that CO2 can really excite and create a wine volcano, which nobody wants that to happen. As always, you can get more exclusive content on my Patreon page. If you haven't yet subscribed below, make sure to do that. And be sure to swing by my website, smartwinemaking.com. If you have any comments, be sure to post in the comments section below. And you can also post in the Smart Winemaking Facebook group. Thanks for watching.